Okay, everybody, I see that some of you are coming in. Thank you for being in here. Oh, I recognize somebody. Yay. <laughs> Good to see you. We are going to start at the top of the hour. Um, thank you. Some of you are coming out in and saying hello. I appreciate that because sometimes I feel like I'm by myself at this end of the uh, at this end of the screen. So let me know if you can hear me well. So it would give you an opportunity to kind of converse with me on the chat. So let me know. Can you hear me? Yes, no. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Fabulous. All right. So I have a lot to cover. Um, I know we set this for about an uh, half an hour, but as I was uh, as I was preparing, I was like, "There's no way." As much as I um, will go pretty fast. I also want you to get a good idea as to what we have. Um, and it's, it's, there's a lot, a lot of new things. So just hang in here with me. <laughs> and I did a presentation for employers um, on Tuesday. I'm going to be covering some of the basics that I touch uh, when I talk to them and that you also need to know, but know that for your benefit and for their benefit, I cover, I'm going to be covering different things in this webinar that I believe apply more to foreign nationals and the kind of questions that I get from you. So that's what we're going to go into. Okay. Okay. Two o'clock. So welcome everybody to what foreign nationals need to know about the fiscal year 25 H1B cap season. And for some of you, um, this, it took me a while to figure out this, why are we calling it 25? And the visas that are being issued, that they will be issued in April, belong to the next fiscal year. So when you are selected, and hopefully you will be selected, and your H-1B is granted and approved, it will count towards next year's fiscal year 25. So that's why I'm putting in here fiscal year 25, even though the process, it's happening now. But as you will see from the presentation, those um, the, the H-1B becomes effective October 1st, 2024, which is the fiscal year for the government, okay? So that's just a first little tip for you. So we're going to talk about the H-1B visa in general, the cap, very unique to the H-1B, the lottery, what is new, and a lot of things are new, the process, the timelines, how do you get notified, remote work, which is a brand new thing, well, not brand new thing for many, but it's it's new to the H-1B in a sense. So it brings a whole new complexity to, to this process because when the H-1Bs were designed, there was no remote work. Uh, cap gap, employment travel, consular processing, and general questions. So here we go. Okay, it is going to be a full one hour most likely of information. This is for you. So please, please, I know, I mean, I have three screens with me right here, but I'm, I shut down everything else because I want you to, this is why you're here, to get as much information as you can. So stay with me for an, about an hour. Every case is unique. Um, you're going to hear me say this a few times. Sometimes I get questions in the chat that are very specific to your case. I am not going to answer those. If there are questions that are general of general interest, I will, if I have a chance, I will answer those. But your case, believe me, is unique to you. Like No one else is like you. Okay. If you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do, because I also post additional information in there, and sometimes you don't get my emails. So that's another way for you to know what's happening in our world. 
Some of you know me, have been working with me for many years. Yay, and I appreciate that. Some of you, this is the first time that you may have seen me. Um, I've been practicing immigration for over 20 years. I start to believe when I started practicing, I probably never thought it was, I was going to be doing this for this long. But the, um, the, the impact that we can make in the world and our economy to our employers and to you is what keeps us going. Even though practicing immigration law is not easy. Uh, it's very complicated, very emotional. In addition to knowing the law, there is a lot more to it. Um, so I appreciate you being here with me and with our team and being the partners that you are. I am an immigrant myself. Um, immigrated from Cuba. I've been in the United States now. My husband tells me for more than, I'm more, more American now than Cuban. I, I've crossed that line and proud to, proud to be so. And for many of you, that's also your journey. So know that I have been in your shoes and so much so that I have a passion for what we do that I've also written a book about H-1Bs and, you know, options. So that's out there. And I use my energy and my passion to help you all. So again, thank you for being here. Okay, just to get you going and make sure that you're with me on a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, one being low. What do you feel your level of H-1B knowledge, H-1B cap knowledge is right now before we begin the presentation. So I want you to give me two numbers. One, the first number is your level of knowledge. <laughs> And the second number is how anxious are you about this process? So, okay, yeah. And this is hopefully, so, <laughs> 100 was not an option, but okay, I get it. <laughs> My goal is that your level of knowledge will go up and that your anxiety will come down as much as I can, okay? So keep those numbers in mind, and I will try to do my best to certainly increase increase your knowledge and lower your anxiety. It's, it, it, is, it is a very difficult process. I, I get it. Um, okay, H1B cap, the lottery, da-da-da-da-da. The basics. You need a bachelor's degree at a minimum, a U.S. The, the, a bachelor's degree or the equivalent of U.S. bachelor's degree. So many of you are in the United States. Many of you have a U.S. master's degree, and I'm going to talk about that. Some of you have a bachelor's degree from abroad. If you do, we need to or you need to do a degree equivalency to make sure that that, and typically we do it because you probably don't know where to go or how to do it and we just basically send it to agencies that we know that do this work and we've been we have no relationship but we've been using them for years um to make sure and that's what we need transcripts and certificates and all that kind of stuff to make sure that the bachelor's degree or whatever degree that you have if it is a degree from abroad it is the equivalent to a u.s degree without that there is no h1b okay you have to be working in what is considered a specialty occupation. This is a term of art. USCIS has their own little definition of what a specialty occupation is, and it's changing, and it changes all the time. So we have to stay on top of what is a specialty occupation. But literally, some degrees that are considered general degrees, like a business administration degree, sometimes even interior designer, um, jobs that potentially somebody does not need a specialized degree to do. I mean, there's interior designers that don't have a bachelor's degree. Now our clients require a bachelor's degree and a master's degree because of the complexity of their operations. And that's what we have to pass on to USCIS with the filings. If you have a degree in business administration, USCIS frowns upon business administration being a specialty occupation. For them, it's, it's, it's not specialized. So we have to play around with whatever courses you have taken to show the specialty of that degree. And th these are just some examples. It is an employment-based visa. Some other visas you could do on your own. You can self-petition, not an H-1B. 
you have initial three years. So when, when the visa is granted is typically for three years with a potential another three year extensions up to six, and then it gets more complicated than that, but you, I'm not gonna go into it right now. I mentioned before, fiscal year starts in October. So October 1st through September 30th. Um, a spouse and unmarried children under 21 can apply for an H4, but there's no work authorization for them. Some of you have emailed me about spouses that potentially have TPS or other statuses where they have an AAD. I will not recommend, or I recommend in general, that they keep those statuses that do not change to H4 because they will lose their employment authorization document. Okay. The cap. Because there is only 85,000 visa new H-1B visa petitions that become available every year in October. And for as long as I remember, there have been more petitions filed, registrations filed that there are visas, to, and you'll see the numbers. There has been a lottery. The, the most creative way that USCIS could come up with selecting um, work visas or, or, or giving work visas to talented workers like you all. So it is a random selection. There have been many, many um, recommendations, proposals by Congress, and depending who the president is, as to ways of changing this random selection. But for now, we still have a random selection. So it really doesn't matter, um, you know, where you're from, how much you get paid, as long as you meet the basic requirements of the petition or the filing, you get entered into the, and you file, you know, everything is done timely, blah, 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 you get entered into the lottery. Chances of selections are the same as long as registered during the registration period. So you do not need to be, Register day first or second, and I tell you, I will not register you day first or day second because it is an electronic system. It has glitches every year, and I would like for other people to go those through those glitches and get them resolved before I put you through the lottery. Okay, so most likely we will be filing you after the first or the second day. And may, it may be even into the, you know, so it opens on a Wednesday. Uh, we may attempt if things are quiet and things are going well, we may attempt a few people and we kind of do it in little batches and to see how what's going on. Uh, we may register some on Thursday and see what's happening, then some on Friday, then if things are going okay, we may register some over the weekend. Um, and whatnot. So just kind of just giving you an idea as to what our strategy is. What is new? A lot. Um, <laughs> I've been doing now this, I think, five years or four years that we've had this registration and every single year has been different. I kind of think, okay, we got the rhythm. We know this. We got it. And here we go. And this year, if you would have told me in November, that I would be telling you that everything is practically new. I would have said, no, you're kidding. But yeah, everything is new. So we have a new registration system and beneficiary centric, which actually out of everything that I'm going to talk about is the only thing that I'm very happy about because I believe it will benefit every one of you in this call. So yay. Beneficiary centric registration. And again, when you see the numbers <laughs> from the last few years, you're going to understand why this is so good. Um, but basically, it's supposed to work one registration, one beneficiary, uh, rather than whatever many, you know, rather than one candidate can be entered 15 times and get potentially selected five times. That's not supposed to happen with all these changes. One registration per passport, that's how they are, that's how they are managing this registration centric process. And you must have a valid passport or travel document. I know maybe one or two or three of you on this call 
may not have a valid passport exactly, but for most of you, you should. Um, and the ones that don't, we have a plan, um, but just make sure again, if you have, have fo been following me, you know that this has been something that I've been talking for a while. The new employer organizational accounts, this, I've, I've gotten some follow-up emails from some of you that have read it. It's like, how do I register? No, no, no. It's an employer organizational account. And I also want you to know you have nothing to do with the registration. Um, you don't at all. And I'll explain the process later on. Just know that in the, in the webinar that I did for employers, I was very specific as to what the employer organizational accounts are all about and what we know about it. This is this is what is fascinating to me. This is February 22nd, and no one has actually seen what the back end of this whole thing looks like. And it's it just it's amazing. Um, new forms, new filing fees, and new online filing accounts. So there. Okay, this is what registration numbers have looked like in the past since 2021. Um, so again, we're looking at 85,000 total available petitions. And so in 2021, we had 2,000, you know, 275-ish, then 22, 308, then 23, 483, and then last year, like 780. As you can tell, people got more and more creative, more and more aggressive um, to the point of being fraudulent and to the point of being criminally investigated for what they were doing to try to get one of these visas. That's how they, how coveted they are uh, for many people. So last year, the way the registration process worked, some foreign nationals paid to get entered into the lottery. I, I've heard that some people got entered 50 times. I, it blows my mind, but what happened to many of those, so you don't, don't feel bad if you were in the lottery last year, no, we're not selected because of the mess that I believe our government created because they would, they could have stopped it in 23 when they saw those numbers going up, but they didn't because it was work for them. Um, but what they did last year, rightly so, they know who is, doing what, whatever. I mean, they have, it's quite often I get asked, well, how do you know? How do they know? Well, believe me, they know. And what bothers me is they don't go after the people that they should be going after, but that's a conversation for a different day. But again, what happened last year is, as you can see, the numbers were astronomical. A lot of people did a whole bunch of stuff that they should have not done. And um, the government, uh, did criminal investigations, you know, filed criminal charges. Many, many, many petitions were invalidated. So many that we were not expecting to have a second lottery. And they did because they had invalidated so many of them that they had to do a second lottery because they had more they had petitions available that were not being used. And uh, so that benefit quite a few of, I think we have more people selected on the second lottery that we had in the first one. When we saw the results of the first lottery, we were just crushed because it was the first time ever that the selection was so horrendous. And we, we didn't have these numbers. These numbers don't get released until two months later. Uh, so we had no idea what was going on. And then later we found out everything that had happened. So all of this new stuff that we just talked about is expected to bring things back to semi-normal, if, if there is such a thing, okay? Okay, something else that I want you to pay a lot of attention to because, I mean, employers pay this filing fees and sometimes we take it for granted. The fees have gone up significantly. And this is, again, I'm sorry, I'm kind of venting here. <laughs> um, but it's just, I... It, you, knowing now, you know, my background, being an immigrant and coming to this country, believing all the opportunities that we have and seeing what the immigration process is turning into, it drives me crazy when we, sh we should facilitate the way talent comes into this country. That's how I came. Um, and the process was not like this. But anyway, 
Um, the filing fees are double, triple, um, and your employers are paying for this. So when you're going into this process, please realize and appreciate that there is a lot of people that are putting their energy, their trust, their money on you. Okay. So take it and 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 I, and and there's just a handful of you that I potentially this applies to. I know my team hears me say this all the time. I adore our clients. I think we have the best clients in the world and thank you for being you. Okay. But of course, there's a few that are like, oh, come on, why haven't you responded to the questionnaire or, you know, or I need to travel because I don't know, the, you know, the sky is blue and I need to see how it looks in my country. Um, you're putting a lot of, at a risk and I'm going to talk about that some more. But just know that, you know, for many of you, your employers, in addition to attorney's fees, will be paying about $3,390 to file your H-1B petition. Those are just government filing fees without talking about premium processing. So look at these numbers and know that you're very valued. As I mentioned before, we have new forms. They still have not even been released. This is a draft that I found online. <laughs> draft not for reproduction, whatever. Um, so no grace period as of April 1st, we'll be using new forms that we don't have access to them yet. So, and I'm, again, I'm saying all of this to you because I, I mean, I started saying, I'm going to lower your anxiety. I'm going to try, uh, but just know that there is one of the things that I'm going to ask you is to keep an open mind and to be flexible and, you know, positive as much as you can, because, it, and we do, it's all on, I mean, we take all of this anxiety, your anxiety to some degree and put it on us. I am online almost, well, I'm online every day, just seeing what else came up, what else can, you know, the latest of the latest so that you don't have to, okay? So if, if hopefully that would lower a little bit of your anxiety. Um, okay, oh, something else that I had, that, also, the latest thing is electronic filing. And USCIS and their marketing committee have done a phenomenal job at pushing how wonderful it is that now we have electronic filing for the first time ever. And no one has filed an I-129 electronically ever. But now this is, you know, in addition to everything else, they, they're offering this to the world. And I know many of you have probably read about the electronic filing and you may be eager to send me an email, but you're going to file my case electronically because this is going to get there faster. Well, let me just tell you, this is literally, I, I, as I just told you, I, I'm online every day, just trying to see what the latest of the latest is. And this was from last week. Um, there are some forms that are electronically available. For example, I think the N-400s, uh, the EADs can be filed electronically, some, um, and a few others. But the I-129 has never been electronically. And 85,000 I-9s, uh, I-129s I file at the same time. I think it will overwhelm USCIS. So this was another, an attorney uh, that sent an email to our listserv saying, good afternoon. Is anyone having problems accessing the USCIS system? Many cases disappear <laughs> from our dashboard in the USCIS online site. Not only that, but today it won't even let us submit anything online. Any advice would be much appreciated. Imagine that that is your H-1B case, okay? Then AILA, which is the American Immigration Lawyers Association, responded. AILA is aware and has been communicating with USCIS since yesterday. They are pushing fixes out since last night and today to, and today to try to resolve this issue. They hope for a resolution today. See this practice alert pushed out yesterday, which we will be updating as we get more information. Da 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 da. The practice alert. Da 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 da. So AL is aware of the my USCIS outages and has reached reach out to USCIS to make them aware. Da da da. So this is why 
I do not plan to file electronically, okay? So just giving you the heads up, there is nothing wrong with paper filing. It is the true tested method of getting stuff to USCIS. And we have done it successful for many, many years. When they get their electronic systems in place, we will go electronic. I mean, I have, I have no problem because we have to print, we have to repair, we have to mail, it's all on us. But I want to make sure that I don't get one of, I don't have to send one of these emails to Ayla saying, what is going on? I cannot file my H-1Bs, okay? So process timelines and notifications. This is a general outline of how the process works. Right now, for many of you, for all of you, I would say, uh, we are in this pre preparation, strategy, due diligence, learning. That's what you're here doing. On, I believe it's February, it's later in the slide, February next week at some point, the organizational accounts will open and we will start working with the employers to open and register their organizational accounts. You employees have nothing to do with that. Then the lottery is conducted. Then we prepare the LCAs, the filing, the certification. Then we file and I... I'll explain what the LCA is, and then the H-1B is kind of two different pieces. Then it gets all filed, and then the H-1B status becomes effective October 1st. Okay, and I kind of mentioned this um, a little, process considerations, please. Flexibility, focus on your case, not what the media says, not what your friend did, not what your whoever, and positive mindset, okay? You can drive yourself crazy by looking and seeing what everybody else is doing. Focus on you. That is what your best energy is suspended, okay? I would never forget, and this was list this year, we had prepared for a national, for a TN processing at the border. Tons of preparation. He was ready. He knew everything. His package was ready to go. And in fact, when he began the conversation with me, his mindset was Z. And when he finished his preparation with me, he said, Giselle, I got this. I'm like, yes, that's what I wanted to hear. Well, the day before he goes to his appointment, well, the day before the, or the morning off, he says, oh, Giselle, I've just been looking online and they're recommending this and the other. I'm like, oh, what did we just talk about? You are ready. Do not look online. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I just, and I was like, just take a deep breath. Look at your file. You're ready to go. And we're not, sure enough, he was approved, but please, stay on your lane. <laughs> there is going to be tons of stuff thrown at you. And, you know, media, they just, that's how they make money by getting you anxious. Okay. So that's one way to keep your anxiety down. Okay. I'm going to talk about a STEM EAD. Many of you qualify. Yes. Apply. More about this later. Must document maintenance with data. More about this later. So just stay tuned. Uh, have a valid passport or travel document. I already touched on that. Plan for no travel abroad. Travel is not required. So even if you get selected, for most of you, if you are in the United States in status, you do not need to go out and come back. In some cases, that's going to have to happen. But I can tell you that that's probably three of you, if anything. Okay, so no worries. Um. Another question that I've gotten a lot is, oh, my visa, visa, not passport, visa stamp, your F1, your H4, whatever it is, has expired. That's okay. Your visa stamp has nothing to do with this process, okay? A visa stamp is only for traveling, and I will talk about more of this later. Okay, STEM eligibility. You're going to get this slide, so I'm probably, I'm, I'm only at a slide 20, so I'm going to I'm going to go quickly through some of these. Um, if you're STEM eligible, yes, 
consider applying. These are the criteria for the STEM eligibility. Again, you, the one thing that I, if for some of you, your employer needs to be an E, not only you have to qualify because of your STEM degree, but one of the things that I find is that the employer is not E and E verify employer. And if they're not, even though you may have an STEM degree, if they're not enrolled in E verify, we cannot use your STEM eligibility. Okay. That's about the, uh, the main thing here that I find some issues sometimes. There's a lot more to this, but for now, that's that's a big one. Um, this is the timeline. Again, employer organizational accounts will open February 28th and will remain open throughout the registration period, which is from March 6th to Friday, March 22nd. The lottery typically runs very quickly right after the lottery closes. So, you know, 22nd to the 31st. And then registration opens March 1st. But remember, the forms that we need to file April 1st are not even available. We don't even know what they look like. So I doubt that anyone will be filing April 1st. Um, and there's more to it, but that's one of them. Okay, how would you get notified if you were selected? So the way the notification works, again, this is a, an employer-driven process. Your employer has an organizational account that they already have, and we're going to work with them to upgrade it, um, or they don't have, and we're going to work with them to create it, and we will invite them. So we will enter their information in our accounts, and we will link our accounts to their accounts so that we can we can do the work for them. We don't want them to touch the forms because the minute they do something in there, we cannot. And I explained that to the employers in the employer presentation. Um, they, your employers, and us will receive an email if your case gets selected or a text that says your account has been up updated. That's all it says. It doesn't say who or anything, just your account has been updated. Whatever that, you know, that's, that's the USAS world. The employer and us have to log in and go through. The, I mean, in some of your cases, some of your employers may be one or two people. Some of our employers are 30. Um, that we have to go and look at each one of them and see who was selected. Um, so this takes a little process and not everybody gets selected at the same time. It, it lingers out for a few days. We, when we um, see that someone was selected, we notify the employer and await their direction to notify you, okay? So don't email me or our paralegals, was, was I selected, was I selected, was I selected? Unless I get notification from your employer that says, yes, please let them know, that's when we will tell you, okay? So hang in there. Um, what happens after notification? So like I said before, filing begins April 1st. Um, we are going to have to file LCAs. We're going to prepare documents, da, 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 da. But our goal is to file all of our H-1B, and we have quite a few of you, which is normal. This is what happens every year. Uh, but we hope to have everybody file and again, this is teamwork. We play our role, you play your role, the employers play, play, pay their role. And, and our goal is to have everybody file within the first two months. Uh, but there's always something that happens. Uh, but that's that's the plan, that's the goal right now, okay? Priority filing will be, so this is something else. Please don't email me saying, are you gonna file mine the first week? There is There is a process to this. And I'll explain what cap gap means. And if you were in that situation, I can guarantee you, you would want to be filed first. So there are some of you that have OPT EAD and do not have a STEM as an option. Some of those OPT EADs expire, say, April 30th. We have to file those H-1Bs before... April 30th, USCIS has to accept those H-1Bs before April 30th for that cap gap to kick in. 
So we have a list of those of you that are in that situation. And those are what's going to be our priority filers because otherwise they will not be able to work past April 30th. Okay. Okay. Informant, let me see, because I, oh, okay. I'm going to take a break for a second here. What's that? I've been talking for 34 minutes and I think I don't want to lose you. So are you all with me? I should have taken, I should have put a break somewhere in there. Yes. Tell me something you've learned so far. Fifty some of you, somebody must have learned something. Cap gap. Timeline was very helpful. Okay. What else? You can still apply for STEM. Yes. Yep. Had to rush for premium processing. No. Count mindset is very crucial. Yes. All right. Thank you. And you know, um, the numbers from the past were a great insight. Yeah. My visa expiration does not matter. Correct. Please. And again, I've gotten that question so many times um, about your visa expiration. It is not an issue. And do not rush for premium processing. Another big one. And I will touch on premium processing again. Thank you so much for those of you that are contributing here, because what you're thinking is also helping others. And what you're saying is also helping others. And it certainly helps me because I don't feel like I'm here talking to myself for half an hour. So thank you. Okay. So here is where we're at with the process for many of you. You will have received or you will receive a... Mark's Gray Immigration Questionnaire, we have tailored it so that it only includes things that we need to know uh, for your process. And you also will have the ability to upload documents. It is very important that you complete these questionnaires and that you also upload the documents that we need you to upload. For example, educational documents. Some of you have uploaded documents, but you have not uploaded. So say you have a U.S. master's, but you didn't upload the bachelor's degree, or you didn't upload the transcripts, or, you know, you uploaded transcripts, but, or degrees, and they're not translated. Um, you may have had any, uh, a degree equivalency. Remember the beginning that I said, you know, it has to be a U.S. equivalent degree. Now, if you don't have one, do not rush to get one because you may get something that we cannot use. But if for whatever reason you've worked with another attorney or you know how to get a degree equivalent thing done, um, you could do that or you can just ask us uh, if for now... I just want to make sure that you do give us all the documents. So not just, again, pieces of them. Just give us the degree and the transcripts for all of your degrees, okay? If you have not done it already, and sorry because I'm, I'm there is, even my team, there is teamwork. There's things that the paralegals do that I have no idea how to do. And I don't know if they can reopen your document thing if you are missing documents for I think they can and if not you can email them and let them know that you oh you, I forgot to add my bachelor's degree can I send it to you or can I you know can you reopen the portal so that you can up, so that you can upload it for those who have not completed the questionnaire maybe you haven't received it yet because we just started to work with you I do have a video on YouTube that you will get a link to it. It's less than nine minutes because I talk for about a minute at the beginning and maybe a minute at the end. Um, but it's very, very helpful. It will save you time completing the questionnaire. I get a lot of questions about, well, what is my status? Well, hopefully if you're in F1 status, that is your status, F1. If you're in H4 status, you're in H4 status. And then I get the question, and my visa has expired. What do I do? Well, don't worry about it. Just give us what your visa expiration was, okay? But watch this video. If you have not completed the questionnaire, um, it will help you. It will save you time. More about documentation. 
And many of you are on F1 and many of you have 20 I-20s because you've been here for a long time, you've gone to school for a long time, but many of those I-20s are repetitive. It's just a copy of a copy that they, you know, one person signed, the other person signed. We don't need all of your I-20s. We just need the sequence of the I-20s. So give us, you know, give us the one that gave the authorization for your first semester or your first year or whatever, not, and I hope that makes sense. Uh, don't just upload everything that is there if half of them are really not applicable or they're a duplicate of something else. Give us as complete I-20s as you can. Most importantly, and this is something that I see a lot, is your last I-20, the one that you have on right now that is approving either your CPT or your OPT or your STEM. That is critical. And I need it signed. And I also need it showing that whatever it is that you're on has been approved and the dates. Okay. And you probably, students, you know what I'm talking about. That is very important. Your EADs, I've gotten questions. Well, I have an expired EAD, I have a current EAD, da, da, da. just upload it all, especially the current one. Um, and resume up to date. This is something else that we see resumes that you haven't up. You haven't updated since you graduated or even since, you know, since your bachelor's degree or whatever it is, then please take it, take a few minutes. This is good for you. Uh, you don't know when you're going to need that resume again. So it is important for us to know, you know, your current situation, your prior situation. So give us an updated resume as much as you can. And then the last one that I'm going to talk about more is your work location. Many of you are working hybrid. Some work, you know, some days at home, some days in the office. Some of you are working completely remotely. This has created um, significant work and additional costs for employers. And let's, so again, I'm going to talk about this more because when, when we file your LCA and we file your petition, if you're planning on moving over the summer and you know that that is going to happen, we kind of need to know where you're going to be living October 1st, okay? Okay, the slide is here again. So one more thing that you've learned so far for those of you that have not communicated with me yet. You can send it to me privately, write a message if you want to, or you can just post it, but tell me something else you've learned. Again, it just gives me an opportunity to take a breath and also to see what you're thinking and that you're here with me. Okay, beneficiary center credit station. I get that is, that is huge. I am so, out of all this craziness that I'm talking to you about, um, I am so happy for that beneficiary center grade registration. The process, the rule, um, it's called the H-1B modernization rule. It came out last year, just after the summer, and it was 500 pages long. And that is the, out of everything that was there, this is the only piece that made it past whatever, you know, channels they had to pass, bureaucratic channels. And I'm just very glad. Uh, international bachelor's degree to be assessed for U.S. equivalency. Yes. Sign your I-20s. Yes. Have you ever seen any exceptions where a student got the extension of the OPT even after exceeding the 360-day work? That is a very specific question that I'm not going to answer. Uh, notify you of your address. Yes. Uh, my visa experience. Okay. I think I'm cut up here. We cannot travel if to correct. 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 Not even unless you unless premium processing. Nope. I that's a good question. I'm going to address that. Thank you. Um. Mm -mm. uh, okay. So let me keep going. So here's remote work, and I, you know, some of you are asking about it. The way the system works, and again, this 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 process was put in place. This is the the H one B rules are probably fifty years old. Um, and this is why there's so many challenges because 
they do not keep pace with the economy and the world. And we just have to work around it. So one of the things that gets filed with your H-1B petition is something called the Labor Condition Application, an LCA. It must be filed for the geographic area of intended employment. So your LCA corresponds with your petition. Again, must be filed for the geographic area of intended employment. I live in Jacksonville, Florida, Northeast Florida. So my our LCAs, so I mean, we have clients everywhere, but I'm just taking Jacksonville as an example. Um, you know, there's Jacksonville beaches, which are 45 minutes from where I leave, leave, live. And there's Orlando, which is two and a half hours from where I live, okay? Jacksonville beaches is probably considered within the same geographic area of intended employment. So if the petition was filed on the LCA for me to work at my home right now, but then I move to the beach, which could be considered within the same geographic area, nothing much needs to happen. I will explain something has to happen in notice of posting, but that's nothing. If I were to move to Orlando, then a new LCA, a new petition, new filing fees. Do you remember that number, almost $3,000 plus attorney's fees? That needs to be filed again because it's called an amended petition because you're not working anymore in the same geographic area of intended employment. This could, that created a lot of issues and continues to, okay? So that is why it's important now. So if you move apartments, again, not a big deal. If you move within the same area, not a big deal. But again, if you move from Miami to Seattle, Washington, it's a big deal. Or even from Jacksonville to Orlando. The, comp the analysis is not easy. It's complex. But these are just general rules. If work from home is allowed, the home address listed as work, need to be listed as work location on your LCA and your H-1B petition. If you have a new work from home address, if the new location is with the same MSA, meaning the same geographic area, basically a new posting is needed, not much. If the new location is considered to be out of the MSA, then that creates problems, okay? Short-term placements are not a big deal, and those are 30 to 60 days. Say now you have to work in a project in Orlando for 60 days, not a big deal. But it's if you move there on a permanent basis, it is, okay? All right, take a deep breath with me. I mean, like I said, this is a lot, and I thank you so much. I know you have all been here with me, um, but I, I spend a lot of time on this presentation because I want you to get as much out of it as you can. Um, so I want to see those numbers going up at the end and the anxiety coming down. All right, gap, gap, employment and travel. I explained this a little bit, the way the cap, gap extension works. Again, if... So be, filing begins April 1st. That's when we can, and, and runs through June 30th. That's, that's the period that we have to file all of your H-1Bs that were selected. And then you move into H-1B status September 30th. If your OPT ends anywhere between April 1st and, and June 30th, we have you as a priority filing. If you have a STEM option, Please apply for that STEM, and I'm going to, hopefully I get a chance to explain why. Well, I, I'm going to explain it to you right now because I get that question so many times. I know it can be a pain in the behind to apply for a STEM, but sometimes, USCIS has been pretty good lately, so I'm going to give them credit where it's due. But some years back, we had petitions that was September 30th, and they had not been adjudicated. They were, they were not adjudicated until January. Who knows why? I mean, USCIS world changes every day. If you benefited from the cap gap, yay, you were able to work until September 30th. This is actually one of the pieces that was in the modernization rule that did not pass. 
They were going to extend cap gap beyond September 30th, but that's not this year. So maybe next year. But back to this year, if you benefit from cap gap and you go, ah, I'm not going to worry about a STEM OPT because I have cap gap. Well, cap gap ends September 30th. If you did not apply for a STEM OPT and your petition has not been adjudicated by September 30th, for whatever reason, you're out of employment. You can stay in the United States, but you cannot work. So it is worth it filing for that STEM because that STEM will give you on ongoing work authorization beyond September 30th if for whatever reason your H-1B was not uh, approved then. And remember, premium processing now is almost $3,000. So it, it, there's a lot of benefits to applying for your STEM if you qualify, okay? Uh, that's cap gap. General reminders for cap gap um, activated not by registration or selection. So whether you get registered and selected, that does not activate the cap gap. The cap gap has to be the full H1B petition was filed and received by USCIS before June 30th. So that is why, again, priority filing. OPT must not have expired before we filed your H-1B. So for some of you, you have very short, you know, your h one many of you, your H-1B, your um, EAD expires at the beginning of June. So we have a little bit more flexibility, but some of you are in April or May. And again, that's kind of what is going to be our priority because we have to get you filed before your EAD expires. Must request change of status, which is, most of you, again, the work extension is only valid until September 30th. Um, so what happens then? You know, how do you get this work extension? So if you get selected, we file, you're receded before the expiration of your DAD, you need to go back to your uh, school and tell them that you need a cap gap I-20. So they need to update SEVIS and provide you with an I-20 that gives you cap gap. That is, there is no EAD required. It's just informing the school and they update your SEVIS. Again, apply for STEM. You're going to hear me that. I think STEM is a STEM OPT is a gift. It's such a gift that attorneys went to the Supreme Court because others were those of those people that do not like foreign nationals and how the talent that you bring to this country took the case to the Supreme Court to fight your ability to obtain STEM OPT. And the Supreme Court said that USCIS was allowed to grant STEM OPT, okay? So just to give you a little background information as to why to me this is so important and why so many people have fought for it. Okay. If you qualify for STEM OPT, the timeline is very tight. And I want to remind, remind you this. You have 90 days to apply before your OPT ends. Please do not wait until the last minute. I know you're all busy, but this is important. And there is nothing that pains me more than someone that qualifies, applies, and for whatever reason, the U.S. Postal Service did not get the filing in time and it gets filed after the filing period and you're out of a STEM OPT. And for some of them, that's it. That's their only opportunity to work. OK, so just if you can, if you qualify, make sure that you're applying timely. This is just a general overview of the F1B work options. Many of you know this. I do want to mention CPT because some of you are on CPT, curriculum practical training. CPT unfortunately does not have the cap gap provision. It does not apply. So if you are under CPT, know that you will need to continue going to school. If you, even if you get selected, you will need to take a summer semester because we need to show that you're in status, maintaining status as of October 1st. And the only way for you to continue to maintain status is going back to school. 
as much as that is painful, okay? Cap gap applies to those on OPT and STEM, but do not does not apply to cap uh, CPT. Traveling, no travel. You're going to hear me say this again and again. Um, after selected from the lottery, but the petition has not been filed yet. So within that ninety day period, risky. And I'm I have a slide just on this. After the H one B was filed. As of a change of status, even if you premium process that petition and it gets approved, if you leave, you cannot enter. You cannot re-enter the United States until October 1st. Remember, that's when that that's when that H-1B becomes effective. So now you have an H-1B that is approved, but it does not become effective until October 1st. So no travel. After October 1st, yes, you can. But now know that to enter the United States, you have to enter with a new H-1B visa. So you have to account for consular processing, which is my next topic. I'm not going to cover this. Just know that this is a separate process after you're granted H-1B status and after October 1st. Some general questions that I get, um, usage of premium. It will not increase your chances of selection or approval. Very expensive and only, um, I, I mean, beneficiaries can pay for, so don't run to your employer to tell them that they should pay for your premium processing. But also, again, it's very expensive. I use it very, very conservatively. Um, so just keep that in mind. Last year, I don't think we filed any of our H-1Bs premium, not even one. And they all got approved. So, uh, and they all got approved in time. Travel, <laughs> this is what I want you to consider. Whenever you think about travel and how important it is, your five years, everything is a risk. Your five years of schooling and work, your family's investment for many of you, and, your tr and their trust on you and your future, your employer's investment and trust on you, your future ability to work in the United States, and much more. So it will be very difficult to convince me that you know travel is absolutely necessary. In some cases it is, but um, my take on travel is no. I've just seen too many horror stories. Um, U.S. master's degree, I've, I've gotten questions about that. If you have a U.S. master's degree and you qualify, we will enter you under the U.S. master's lottery, meaning you have to have completed your master's degree by the time of filing, not by the time of registration. There's a few of you that are in that situation, okay? Continue to work on getting your degree certificate as that, that's the strongest evidence that you have. Some of you will get selected under the regular cap. So your, your notification is going to say regular cap. Don't panic. Remember, and I'm, this is something I may have said before. I don't think I did. Those with a U.S. master's degree have a little advantage in this process, and they generally get selected more. So my ratio, well, I shouldn't talk about my ratio because it, it's different every year. But those with a U.S. master's have a slightly better chance selection because they get entered into the lottery twice. I'm not going to go into the millions of details on that. But so you may get selected under the U.S. cap master's, which is there's 20,000 visas just for them. Or because they also put you under the general registration, you may get one of the regular visas. It doesn't matter how you get it. It what matters is that you got it, okay? So don't panic. I'm a runner. Some of you, I'm a triathlete. I'm a runner. Some of you know that. And this to me is, some of you, this is what you do. You know, you read the sign that says, runners move to the side of the road when a vehicle approaches, but you don't see the danger on the side of the road, okay? Keep an open mind, <laughs> Everything that you read doesn't necessarily apply as it is, okay? Okay, very quick. 
As soon as your name is selected in the lottery, the Mark Scray team will send me an email. Let me know that I was selected. What do you think? True or false based on what I have told you? Thank you. All right, you're paying attention. My H-1B is selected and filed as a change of status in the United States and can make plans to travel abroad. True or false? Okay, yay. Foreign workers with EADs expiring in April need their H-1B caps, well, April, May, need their H-1B caps filing done in April to obtain, well, I should have said April through June, to obtain the cap gap. The Mars Scray team must work on those cases first. I will want the same for me. True or false? Oh, this one is taking some thoughts. If you were one of those that need cap gap, would you want your petition file first? <laughs> yes. Um, after I submit my questionnaire and documents, the immigration team will need a few days. Now I get many emails like, oh, I submitted my questionnaire. Do you need anything else? Remember, there's hundreds of you. We will need a little, you know, just, it's great. We got it. We know we you re, we received it. Just give us a few days before you reach out, okay? Okay, now on a scale of one to 10, are you totally confused or you're happy that you were here today with me? 10, you're more confident, happy. One, Giselle, you drove me crazy. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Well, I am also very happy that you were here. Know that we've got your back. Um, we're working as best we can. We want the best for you, okay? Uh, you can email us when, uh, with another aha moment um, if you learned something new. Um, it sounds like you all did, so I appreciate that. Again, um, Da, 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 da. So, yeah, I mean, we, your paralegals will be working with all of you. Um, again, give us some time. There's quite a few of you going through this process, but we've got you. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years, and we want nothing more than to help you out and your employers and our country. Um, if you have more specific, not as, I shouldn't say specific questions. The reason why you found this helpful is because over the years, I collect the questions that you give me. I see the questions and the emails that we get. And I put these presentations together based on the questions that I that we get. You that you send me or that you may send your paralegals, your paralegals tell me, hey, this is a good question to add, add to the webinar. We I've gotten this a few times. So that's how we get here. Okay. So you help me. If you have a general question, not just you know, my little case, your little, your, not your little case, I know it's an important case, but your specific questions, just email your paralegals. They will help answer. And if not, I will help answer. Um, but if you have general questions that you think will help the group, uh, you can use this QR code and you can send us the email. And what I'm doing um, is I'm doing a Q&A with Giselle once a month, and you should have access to that. Um, and I also do newsletters every month where you will get information that I, that again, it, it comes from questions that I get from you, okay? So I hope this is what a receipt notice, a registration notice selection looks like. If you, some of you haven't seen it, I hope to get one of these for all of you, okay? Thank you so much. Top of the hour, 302. I kind of figured that's that's how long it would take. I very much appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, we are here for you. Uh, we've got you. We have a phenomenal team and you're awesome. Your employers are terrific. And I, we're just privileged to do this work, okay? Take care. Bye, everybody.